Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAAS YouTube channel. And this one is going down in the AAAS Journal Author Series. And I'm very happy to have Mauro Dionofrio with us today. Hi, Mauro. Ciao, Frank. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Oh, you're so welcome. Well, it's a fascinating paper I think we're going to go through. So where are you at? Where are you at in Italy? I'm a, I, I live in Venice, Venice. and I work, I, I work in Padua at the Department of Physics and Astronomy in, in Padova, the, the Galileo Galilei. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very. So how are things, uh, how are things going uh, COVID-19 coronavirus wise? Are you guys pretty much opened up at this point in time? Or are you no, still shut down? The department is still closed. I, I suppose also in America, uh, we can also operate uh, through the Zooming session with students and uh, collaborators uh, yeah we are we've been going virtual um, and we will probably do at least at Arizona State University we'll probably do some combination of virtual and social distancing in yeah. person for the fall courses so but that's a it's a TBD because of course cases are spiking in the in the US so um, yeah. not so great but um, it's a difficult situation. Uh, that's <laughs> interesting. So, what do you what do you like to do for research generally? So, in general, I work on the structure and the evolution of galaxies and the active galactic nuclei. So, mm -hmm. the paper you asked me today is one of the series concerning the the scalar relation of galaxies, mm -hmm. particularly so, the early type galaxies. Okay. Uh, and with that, why don't we go ahead and take a look at this fascinating paper. So we are going to walk through on the origin of the fundamental plane and Faber-Jackson relations, implications for the star formation problem. And Moro, take us away. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this paper is uh, uh, my answer to a long-standing problem, uh, not, which is the so-called fundamental plane problem. So when we describe uh, galaxies, uh, uh, in particular early type galaxies, we use uh, some parameters, for example, radii and uh, velocity dispersion to determine the velocity of the stars. So when we use these parameters, uh, 25 years ago in 1987, uh, American astronomers discovered that using uh, the effective radius, so that is the radius which includes the, the half luminosity, the total luminosity of the galaxy, and uh, the effective super brightness, so the mean super brightness inside this radius, and the central velocity dispersion. Mm -hmm. uh, when we use these parameters for, to, for, to describe galaxies, we observe that galaxies are not randomly distributed in this space, in, three, in this three dimensional space, but they are distributed in a plane. And this plane has a small scatter. This plane was named after a few years of research, a fundamental plane, because uh, we, many people soon understood that behind this plane, there is, a, it is enclosed the physics of the formation of the galaxy and their evolution. In particular, because the um, fundamental plane appears tilted with respect to a plane that physics predict, which is the virial uh, uh, theorem. The virial theorem connects the, effect, the radius, the velocity dispersion of a galaxy with the mass. And so when we know, when we put uh, this, a galaxy in this space, in this three-dimensional space, uh, which is uh, uh, done using the effective radius, the effective super brightness, and the central velocity dispersion. Mm -hmm. All that, every galaxy lie in a plane. So we, uh, but this, the position of every plane defines one mass, because uh, with three coordinates, you have a single mass for a, for a galaxy. Okay. When, when you use, a, a lot, when we have, you have a sample of galaxies of the same type of different masses, you expect that the virial, that they are all in virial equilibrium because the virial equilibrium is reached very soon after the stars are formed. Mm -hmm. So um, you expect that galaxies are all distributed along this plane. 
On the other hand, you observe using the observational parameters that this plane is tilted. So, so very soon astronomer ask uh, why this plane is tilted with respect to the virial prediction. Mm -hmm. And many, many explanations have been attempted uh, up to now in 25 years. And the most successful predict that the, the, there is a, a continuous variation of the mass to light ratio of, a ga of galaxies depending on the mass. So okay. the, mass, the mean mass to light ratio should change progressively with the mass. So the stellar population should change its properties according to their mass. And uh, this can explain, uh, is, is, was one of the explanations, but many others have been attempted, in particular considering that the, 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 the galaxies may have, uh, in the elliptical galaxy in particular, were considered uh, uh, homologous system. So very similar in structure and dynamics. But uh, in, in our paper in 1993, we demonstrated that uh, the early type galaxies have non-homologous systems. Okay. So they have a, a structure that is different uh, depending on the mass. So either the dynamics and the structure of the galaxy changes with the mass of the galaxy. So even when we uh, attempted, the, the, we, we, this is another possible explanation of the tilt of the fundamental plane if the structure, the non-homology of the gas, of the, of the galaxy is taken into account. So many, many other possibility, possibility consider also the presence of the dark matter that uh, should change uh, for every galaxy. So many, many, but many people have tried the different explanation, for example, different init initial mass, mass function and other possible explanation. And so the problem is still uh, in particular open is not yet solvent up to now. And uh, this paper tried to answer to this, uh, uh, to this problem because uh, what we are realizing in these 25 years is that uh, behind uh, this uh, problem, there is a, a fine tuning uh, between this, the properties of the stellar population and the structure and dynamics uh, of, a, of each system. So the, each galaxy should, uh, the, the stellar population of each galaxy should in some way be aware of the structure and dynamics and total mass of the galaxy, of each galaxy. So the stellar population is not free. You cannot have any kind of population in every galaxy. So the, the stellar population should in some way be constrained depending on the structure and the mass which is involved in the formation of the galaxies. Okay. And this, uh, uh, when, uh, uh, so the, 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 the final uh, uh, solution uh, that uh, in our, uh, uh, we hope that it is a correct solution, is that when we couple the virial theorem with uh, the relation that you, that, you, that you see here, you see there is a relation in the abstract between the luminosity, the total luminosity, with the mean star formation of a galaxy and the velocity dispersion of those stars. So this uh, relation implies that there is, uh, that it exists at least another plane which involves the luminosity, the star, the star for the mean star formation rate and the, the star and the velocity dispersion of the stars. Okay. When you, when, if you go on, you can uh, uh, see that the, this relation can be written uh, as in this way when you have the luminosity, which depends on a factor that is connected to the velocity dispersion and it is dependent also on the velocity dispersion sigma. With the, here we put an exponent two because the, the exponent two explain one particular behavior that we observe in the scale relation, but in general, this relation should be, uh, this exponent might party and simulation, numerical simulation, demonstrate that, uh, that we can have a lot of possible different value of this uh, uh, exponent here. Okay. So, uh, when, uh, if you say that uh, each galaxy in the, the uh, in this space, uh, log array, 
Logi A and Log Sigma, uh, you can have uh, that a galaxy lie in the plane, in the virial plane, but there is a, at least another plane with that is the one defined by the luminosity that uh, uh, is connected to this relation here. And you, when you put, uh, if you go on, you say, uh, you go to the figure, you go on in the paper. It's like. It, yes, you go, there is a figure, uh, go on, go on. Go on. You can uh, figure, ah. figure one, I think, Ekogwa, stop. In figure one, you can see that in, the, in, this, in this space, in log RA, log EA, log sigma, there is a, a plane here which represents the mass. And the plane, which is tilted with respect to the other, represents the luminosity, the total luminosity. So if you uh, intersect two planes in this space, you have a line. And yeah. so the galaxy that should, uh, should uh, reside along this line. And uh, uh, with the, uh, when the galaxy is here, it has a given mass, it has a given luminosity. And so in this way, when we look at the, project, at the projection of this uh, line in the uh, different uh, space, uh, for example, in the uh, MUE and RE, RE space, uh, or in, the, uh, in other space that represent the projection of this, of this space, you have uh, that uh, you, if you go on, you, you see that uh, according to the slope uh, of this uh, line, you have, uh, if you go uh, figure three, I think, if you see, if you go to figure three, I think it is figure three. Yes, okay, figure three. This is uh, one projection of, the, of this space, uh, log E versus log R E. Yeah. And uh, the, this, this line is exactly along the line that uh, represents the so-called zone of avoidance of galaxies in this space. Right. So, and this is valid for system of very different masses from stars to, to galaxy clusters. So the, the, the physics is the same. And uh, uh, this space, this region is, uh, is uh, always empty. And the region and the line that represents this space uh, is, uh, is given by the exponent beta that uh, uh, gives the relation between luminosity and sigma and star formation. For example, uh, uh, we have uh, done uh, recently a paper that it is now accepted on astronomy and astrophysics uh, in which we clearly demonstrated that varying this exponent beta, we have a different, uh, different uh, slope of this line, and we can uh, observe that when galaxies are passive, they are quenched objects, the maximum possible uh, slope of this line is equivalent to that predicted by the virial theorem, that in this case it is exactly minus one. Okay. If you go, for example, in the mass radius relation, you can observe that varying beta, you, have, uh, you can reproduce exactly the, the, the shape of the mass lumin radius relation and observe it again that when the galaxies are quenched, uh, as the star formation is stopped, mm -hmm. all the system, uh, are distributed along the, the predicted value for the, in the virial case. So it seems that uh, the virial condition uh, appears to be fully achieved when galaxies stop their star formation activity. So right. they are completely stopped and there are only systems, a system that, that is uh, decreasing progressively in luminosity because the star are switching off. Got it. Okay. Yep. I'm so, with... so the the, mm, the solution of the fundamental plane, if you come back to Figure Two, uh, is achieved when uh, you uh, consider that for each galaxy, okay, Figure Two, you see each point here represents 
the intersection of this plane and represent the possible position of a galaxy in this plane. So the fundamental plane occurs because the, each plane representing the mass and the plane representing the luminosities have different zero points. Mm -hmm. Zero point depends on the var variable that you have. Uh, we have uh, in this uh, equation uh, shown uh, at the beginning of the paper. But uh, when, uh, if you understand that this zero point is different from galaxy to galaxies, uh, you necessarily to have a fundamental plane with a small scatter. There, there must be this uh, um, fine tuning between the position of this plane because otherwise the uh, scatter around the fundamental plane would be great, very big. And observation instead shows that uh, the uh, scatter around the plane is very small. Right. So the combination of the tilt and the scatter implies that uh, this connection must exist between stellar population and the structure and dynamics of the early type of galaxies. Uh -huh. There are no other possibility to have uh, s such a solution. Cool. Okay. Have you some question now for me? <laughs> no, I'm good right now. If you want to keep going, I'm, I'm following you. Okay, I can go on. Uh, so the, the, all, the, all the, 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 the most important things is to understand uh, that the Faber-Jackson relation, uh, which is the relation between luminosity and sigma, mm -hmm. is different uh, from what we have uh, understood up to now. So up to now, the, we have, uh, with, when Faber discovered this relation in 1976, uh, uh, the relation uh, was directly interpreted as a different translation of the Virial theorem. Because when you write a virial equation, uh, you can substitute the mass and multiply and divide by luminosity, and mm -hmm. you get an equation which, correct, which connect luminosity and velocity dispersion. Right. But the slope again of this relation uh, is different from that predicted from the virial theorem, because the virial theorem predict, uh, predicts uh, uh, an, an exponent equal to two, while, while observation shows that the, uh, the, the slope observed is higher than two. Is originally was four for, uh, for the Faber and Jackson data, but now we, we have a lot of data that demonstrate uh, that the, this uh, uh, slope is, approxim is approximately three. So again, different from the uh, virial expectation. So we must uh, 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 look at this relation in a dif with different eyes. And uh, in, at the end of this paper, we, uh, and also in the recent research that we have done uh, with my collaborators, uh, we use the illustrious uh, simulation showing that uh, uh, when we look at simulation of hierarchical formation of galaxies, we can observe the, the, the faber jackson relation, the connection between luminosity and sigma at different cosmic epochs, you know, different redshift. And we can observe with the, how simulation uh, move and evolve this relation. Not only, not only this, we can follow each galaxy again, uh, across its evolution, and we see that the single galaxies the single galaxy move in a way different from that uh, uh, expected for the world population of galaxies. So what we have to do is to distinguish the Faber-Jackson relation, which, uh, which is, is simply the fit of the distribution observed in luminosity and sigma by all galaxies, and what is the behavior of a single galaxy in this space. The single galaxy is evolving luminosity while the velocity dispersion is uh, remained approximately constant unless there are merging events that can disturb the, 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 the kinematics of the galaxies. So sure. when we look at simulation, we observe that uh, the galaxy move in a random wave in this space uh, depending on the merging activity and the feedback effects that uh, are present. 
So, no. these are, uh, so these, these simulations, these are uh, <clears throat> n-body large-scale structure calculations? Yeah, yes. The lucid simulation is a, a, a simulation uh, that uh, uh, evolved the universe in the, the very, very first epochs. Uh, it, it involves dark matter and uh, gas and uh, the formation of stars. And so we have, uh, we can see and observe the structures that evolve, that merge, that have a feedback because stars uh, explode, supernova explode, IGN uh, are, are emits uh, powerful radiation. So we have uh, a, a, an approximative uh, idea how, how our hierarchical uh, universe have been evolved up to now. Right. So uh, uh, if we understand that the, 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 the Faber-Jackson relation should be uh, revisited, uh, looking at the, at the behavior of the single galaxies and not of the old set of galaxies, we understand why the relation that we have seen in the abstract, uh, if you come back to the abstract, this relation which connect uh, luminosity and sigma in some way is important because uh, uh, we have a, 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 a factor L, L prime, L prime zero and sigma and L prime zero must uh, embed all the behavior of the star formation activity. Okay. So this uh, uh, means that uh, each uh, galaxy has a its own luminosity depending on the, of the peculiar history of the star formation that uh, the galaxies has, uh, has had. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the trick that we use to understand the, 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 the fundamental plane. Cool. If, you go, if you go on, uh, equation two or three, others I don't remember now, you can observe that uh, uh, the second page. Yep, on it. Okay, now let's go on. Okay, you see the equation here that uh, this is the equation of the virial theorem. Right. The virial theorem in log, in log form connect, you see the effective radius, the velocity dispersion, and the effective surface brightness. And this is a zero point which depends on the kinematical condition of the galaxies and the mass to light ratio. So the, the, this is the zero point fundamental plane, which depends on this. The, the, the old explanation uh, uh, of the fundamental plane implies that these coefficients uh, should uh, vary according to the mass of the system in order to keep the fundamental plane tilt and with a small scatter. There are no other possibility for this. But if you go on a second equation, when we, when we observe that uh, the galaxy luminosity is normally written in this way, which is the integral of uh, the stellar population, uh, the star formation, the initial mass function. So in the end, the, the luminosity of a galaxy depends on the mean star formation rate sure. and the age of the system. And the, and the mean mass to light ratio. Mm -hmm. But the, at the same time, we know from observation that this relation exists, which is the Faber Jackson relation. So these two luminosity should, these two formulas should give the same luminosity. Okay. And when we write this relation in this way, if you go to the next page, next page. Yeah. Okay, you can see that uh, the, uh, this relation uh, this, uh, gives the uh, three equations that we have in, my, in our hands. So the uh, fundamental plane, the uh, virial plane, and this relation which uh, gives the luminosity as a function of uh, the effective radius and this exponent beta which depends on the variation of the mo motion of the galaxies in the Faber-Jackson space. Right. 
when you we intersect these two plane you have a, this relation which gives uh, the so-called Carmendi relation because Carmendi discovered in 1977 the correlation between the, between the effective radius and the effective super brightness. And mm -hmm. he was the first to note that the, the slope of this plane is different from that expected from the vehicle expectation. And also different from that of uh, galaxies of constant luminosity. In particular, when we have the galaxies that uh, have a value of beta very, very negative, when uh, the galaxy is uh, quenched, so the luminosity is dropping off, is going down very quickly because the stars are stopped. So the star formation is stopped and this, this, the stellar population, the luminosity decreases. So this exponent, beta, in the Faber-Jackson plane, should be the, should be very very negative. When it is uh, when you consider and you f you vary this exponent, you observe that uh, the slope of the relation in the log a log a log a space converges to minus one. Converges cannot be greater than minus one because the re minus one is the limit imposed by the v realization. So all the exponent uh, uh, greater the uh, only the great the, the largest galaxies that are today very old and are in a passive state forms the the, the relation that we observe in the log array log e space. So the, this this means that uh, we have a catch uh, a proof of. Uh, that this intersection between these two planes is not a fantasy, but is, it is proved by the fact that this slope is uh, exactly that, the one we observe in the real cases. Mm -hmm. Not cool. only this, but when we couple this relation, the Fidelio relation with the mass radius relation, as I said before, Again, we observe exactly the behavior of the relation because the mass radius relation is not uh, linear, but is curved and the curvature converges to, to the values of one. And the values of one is that predicted by the virial theorem. Right. So in the end, what we have to say is that uh, uh, the, the fine tuning between uh, uh, that originate, that is at the origin of the fundamental plane, depends on the fact that uh, this relation of connecting luminosity and, and velocity dispersion physically exists. It, it, uh, at the beginning, it was difficult to believe it because uh, why luminosity of a galaxy should be aware of the velocity of the stars? But if you understand that luminosity is a process of star formation and that star formation changes according to the dynamics of the system, because when the stars have a big velocities, it is difficult that the gas can, can converge and collapse and form new stars. Right. So in some way, the, each, the, the, form, the star formation in a, galaxy, in a galaxy should be aware of the, condi of the dynamical condition. Uh -huh. in, in, the, in the end, the luminosity should uh, depend uh, in some way also on the velocity dispersion of the stars. Mm -hmm. this, is the, this is the news. Cool. Uh, in, the, in the end, uh, we propose uh, in the appendix of this paper, propose a new possibility uh, of uh, the explanation if you go to the appendix uh, we, we propose a new uh, possible interpretation of the uh, okay of this of the relation that uh, uh, the faber jackson relation and uh, this is done also first for for the single stars and for the galaxies of the world in other words, uh, uh, if you, uh, the idea is the following, a, a single star is approximately a black body. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, uh, why not a galaxy, which is a sum of many stars, could be 
approximated as a black body too. Okay. Because, okay, this is the idea following that it is behind this calculation that I've shown a particular interesting, interesting cases. Uh, for example, that the mean density of kinetic energy in a star and the mean density of gravitational energy and the mean energy density of photons are approximately of the same order of magnitude. So uh, if you go on in this paper, you can uh, observe that uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Faber-Jackson relation may be looked at, uh, not uh, as, as a simple virial equation, a translation of the virial equation, but as the particular um, uh, interrelation between the energy, the energy of the systems. So in the end, you have a, a, an equation which gives you the information that the luminosity of a galaxy might be uh, dependent on the kinematical condition of the stars that are inside the galaxies. This is, uh, this can be, um, uh, regarded, it could be an erratic position, but uh, there are <laughs> some proof now uh, that this uh, can be a, a really a, a, a true situation. In particular, we have uh, uh, written an equation in this paper that uh, demonstrates the, the evolution of the Stafford, the evolution of the mean Stafford yeah, rate the evolution of the mean star formation rate should depend on the uh, global properties of the galaxies as a whole. Mm -hmm. If you go to the equation uh, in the, in, I don't remember before, or I do in the, not in the appendix, uh, but before, uh, uh, before the uh, appendix. Okay. there is an equation before between uh, the star formation rate, okay, uh, we go up a, a little bit up, again up, there is an equation. Okay, this one, number 27. 27, okay. We've got a little lag here on our internet, so that's yeah. all okay. good. Number, equation 27 uh, yeah. is uh, a possibility that the, the evolution of the star formation in a galaxy depends on many of the, of the global condition, of the kinematical condition, of the stellar population that is formed. So it is a complicated, uh, that can, it, this equation can be demonstrated only through simulations. We have no other possibility. But uh, what we have done is uh, up to now is that uh, we have two observ observational proofs it has the, the slope of the Corman D relation and the slope of the mass radio relation uh -huh. that are connected to uh, uh, the existence of a relation which gives uh, the luminosity of a galaxy not only as a, as a function of, this, of, of, it, of its star formation, but also of the velocity dispersion of the, of the stars inside it. Okay. Okay. But this, is, this is all. <laughs> So what is new then? So what are, what is uh, where do we go from here? Sort of given given what you published, and what, what are sort of the the next steps? I, I have already mentioned the, uh, a paper and uh, two papers that are already in the uh, in the archive in the web uh, archive, and uh, one of these is already accepted on astronomy astrophysics, and these papers are dedicated to the scaling relation uh, of galaxies. And in particular, we have demonstrated that uh, with using simulations that uh, what we have written in this paper in, 19, in 2017 is correct because we observe exactly the also simulation gives exactly the same slopes. And this is a good, uh, a good uh, news because uh, the, the, the simulation reproduce uh, the, the, the observed scaling relation, the, the, the Corman D relation and the, and the mass radio relation. But not only this, the simulation demonstrate that uh, going back to, in, with redshift, uh, the, this uh, relation uh, uh, changes their appearance. In particular, the, the tail of the bright system of the bright galaxies uh, was not present before Z equal two. 
Okay. It, appear, it appears only at recent epoch after after Z, Z equal 1.6, for example. Okay. And the, this, this tail appears because galaxies, the massive, the most massive system, are becoming quenched, quenched and derealized. Okay. Okay, so the next steps are to uh, test uh, the simulation. If uh, this idea that the, scan, that the star formation changes according to the global properties of the star, of the galaxy, okay. is correct or not. Okay, this is the most important point. And how do you, how would we test that in the future? Or that okay. we test now? We, can, uh, we, we, we have uh, uh, the, the even better simulation now that, uh, uh, not only, but there are many possibilities that are, uh, gives uh, at any epochs uh, the luminosity, the, 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 the stars that are formed, the metallicity, the, 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 the velocity dispersion of the galaxy. So we can look uh, deep and deeper in the, in the product of the simulation of different epochs uh, and try to reconstruct the history of the galaxy in its uh, global properties in its star formation. Right. Cool. Okay. Cool. So, might I be, hope it's clear. clear. <laughs> yeah, I got you. I'm with you. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it might be kind of fun to make an animation of the evolution of the fundamental plane as a function of redshift, let's say. Something. Yeah, yes. We need also, of course, a big telescope to go to high redshift and to test uh, the property of galaxies at even like higher and higher redshift because up to now, the maximum redshift uh, are around one. Yeah. So the, we have uh, limited views uh, when the ELT telescope will be okay. in operation, we probably will go much deeper and far back in time and we probably could observe the variation of the fundamental plane properties with redshift. But this is, it is a longer way to do, to, to, to go. <laughs> now you get it's your predictions. Long... Now, so it's a good time to do predictions, right? <laughs> okay. Now. So very cool, very cool. Mauro, I want to thank you so much for uh, walking us through your paper and where the field is headed there. And, um... well, thank you, thank you, Frank, for the invitation. Has oh, been uh, very appreciated. <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you everyone for listening in. And if you want to get in touch with Morrow, um, you know how to do that. We won't be putting his email address in a, in a YouTube video. Um, yeah. and, and reach out to. We him. Will, the video will appear in the your in website. Uh, it will, it will, no, it will appear in the AAS American Astronomical Society YouTube site. Ah, YouTube channel. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I will talk to you about the details of that after after we sign off here. So thank you everyone for listening in and we'll see you soon. Bye bye. Ciao, ciao.